Government is God's thing. Politics is man's thing, but both of them are important and we do politics every day. I want to give you the report on what happened with issue one. What did issue one teach us about the health of the body? Whether you voted or not, you had a voice. I, uh, for, for those of you who um, maybe were not around uh, the first time I was here, uh, I am uh, from the Center for Christian Virtue. We are the state's largest Christian public policy uh, organization in the state. And um, basically all those tall buildings around the state house are full of lobbyists. The taller the building, the more lobbyists. And how many know God's need, God needs his lobbyists at the state house too, right? We need to make sure that our intentions, that our needs and best interests um, are on, on top of mind for those that say they represent us. And so that's what I do. But it, I have to be honest, it was not something that uh, I came to uh, with, a, uh, uh, with excitement. Um, I, I come from a position, I've been there about three and a half years, but I, I really did not like politics. I didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, I don't know if I really understood it. Um, and, uh, and so this is what the Lord had to do. I started finding myself, my wife and I, we were be in DC. Uh, here and there, and um, I was in D.C. probably every three or four months. I got to testify before Congress. Um, folks called me in to talk about what was going on with the youth, and also, um, you know, this one particular time, I got an opportunity to actually share my testimony. Um, what God has done in my life through God's people, God's power, and God's principles. And uh, Nancy Pelosi was in there, Ilhan Omar was in there, uh, the brother that looks like an action figure with the, uh, the eye patch, uh, Dan Crenshaw was in there. And um, it was the most insane thing. And I'm like, Lord, what are you doing? It got to the point where I was uh, uh, in the front row of our church and um, a preacher from California was there that morning. And he, uh, he calls me up to the altar. And, and I don't know that I've ever had a 10 minute conversation with this man before, uh, just high and by when he came in for conferences. But he said, David, I know you don't want this, but when the phone rings and it's about politics say yes it's your father that's how much I didn't want it that's how much I didn't see it in the purview of my Christian walk the Lord had to tell me when the phone rings knucklehead say yes <laughs> it's your father and uh, it was only a few weeks later some of y'all know how it is how the Lord you know uh, get your attention a few weeks later um, I got a call from uh, the president of Center for Christian Virtue they wanted me to talk about a a certain issue related to young people, uh, to some members. And I get up to, to leave that morning. And he said, Dave, before you leave, why don't you pray about coming to work for us full time at the Center for Christian Virtue? And I dropped my head because I knew that was the word. And um, I've been there for three years. But I think one of the things that I'm learning now, family, and hopefully before we get into this, service, this sermon this morning, we all get an understanding uh, of government and politics and the role between the two, because I'm learning this. I learned that government is God's thing. How many know government is God's thing? Um, but politics is man's thing. Let me say that again. Government is God's thing. Politics is man's thing. But both of them are important and we do politics every day, right? Um, government is how God aligns order in society. And there's three different kinds of government, right? You got family government, you've got church government, right? You have leaders established here at church at the center. Um, and then you also have civil government, right? When they came over from England and they were, you know, uh, trying to escape that, that tyrant over there, they said, listen, man, we can't have all the power in one man's hand, because according to Jeremiah, the heart is desperately wicked above all things who can know it. They went to the scripture and they said, we need to separate the powers. And so what did they do to separate the powers? They went to the scripture again in Isaiah 33, where it said, the Lord is king, the Lord is judge, the Lord is lawgiver. That's the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch that your pastor served so faithfully in not too long ago. And so this whole thing that we call America was based on the scripture 
and how we even form our, uh, our, our form of government. And so how many would know that government family is quite clearly God's thing, all three forms. But what about politics, Dave? See, politics is man's thing. And politics is man's way of getting his needs and wants met within the context of God's government. Does that make sense? So how do we get our needs and wants met, especially when we have these representatives, right, that's supposed to speak for us within the context of God's government? So it's, it's very important that we all engage in it, and we do. For uh, honk your horns if, if you have children at home. Okay. <laughs> Only one of y'all admit, right? So some of y'all got children at home, some of you have grandkids. You remember, I have four, they're all adults now. Um, but when my kids were growing up, you know, Christmas would come. Every year seems to come. And um, my son would, would say, say he wanted a video game system, right? And these things are like $5,000 you know, video game systems. I'm like, you know, we just got you the Wii, you know, last year, and you, you know, you're not getting another video game system, right? He's like, dad, come on. Like, like if, if I go back to school in January and I don't have this new video game system, like they're gonna bully me, I'm gonna get beat up. This is a healthcare issue, right? And um, I'm like, boy, get out of here, you're crazy. Does he give up? No, what does he do? He goes and lobbies mom, the next head of state. And he says, Mom, I need this video game system. I don't know what's wrong with Dad. He's tripping. Um, he's not trying to hear me. Um, he's not trying to meet my needs. And Mom says, wait a minute. You know what? You, you, you bring a good point. I get the health care thing. I don't want my son to be harmed at school this January. Listen, I'm going to caucus with your father. And between now and December 25th, the House will make a decision, just like down in Columbus, that they do every, every day. This is politics within the form of family government, and we all do it every day, all of us. And so if we know we have to have politics in the church, right? We have to have decisions be made in the church. We have politics in the family. Why would we not think that believers are supposed to be functioning within the political system of our society, civil government? Does that make sense to everybody? Good. All right. So what I came here to really talk about today um, is something that's been on my heart ever since uh, November um, where we had the issue one election. How many know that didn't go our way? Um, yeah, unfortunately. Um, but you know, just like COVID was kind of an indicator of where the body was, right? People say, well, you know, we still don't have people coming back from COVID. That's not COVID's fault. That's COVID revealing the health of the body. There was something wrong with us before COVID that COVID revealed and brought to the light. Issue one, similar to that, was a vital sign check. We all know what it is like to go to the doctor and, and get a, a, a wellness check. But how stupid would it be to go get our health wellness check and we never show up to get our report? What is, what is the report on how my health is either declining or doing well. So we already knew there was a problem. That's why we went to the doctors in the first place to get a checkup. But what if we never went back to get the report? See, today I want to give you the report on what happened with issue one. What did issue one teach us about the health of the body? Um, this was a, a, a 12 month battle for me and for our team and many others across the state. Um, you know, we fought that fight for, for 12 months, running across the state, trying to get everybody uh, to, to know what was going on with the issue. All in all, we probably spent um, between both sides $90 million, about 60 million on the pro-choice side, about 30 million on the pro-life side. It was a battle. The good news is, I have never seen the body of Christ come together um, in unity like I did with uh, the, the issue one campaign. Um, man, I mean, the, the Catholics, the, the denominations, the non-denominations, different age churches. Um, man, it was beautiful how everybody came together. I'll be 49 this year. I've never seen anything like it. But how many know the remnant just wasn't enough? 
The remnant was strong, but it wasn't enough. And even though it wasn't enough, I'm thankful for the remnant, many of which I'm talking to this morning. Um, so let's get into this thing. Um, the population of Ohio, I want to give you some real quick, quick stats. And then I want to share with you a prophetic word that the Lord gave me the week of the election. Um, just for your, your context, in Ohio, we have about 12 million people. 11, seven, right? 12 million or so people. Of those that are over the uh, you know, voting age, you got about 9 million. So 9 million people in Ohio could have voted, had a, had a voice in what happened with issue one. Because as soon as issue one happened, everybody started blaming folks. Man, it was that commercial, that 30 second commercial about the, you know, the, the, the little girl. It was it was the left. It was the the Democrats. <laughs> and what the Lord said, no, no. If a 30 second commercial could, could get a Christian, a believer to either not vote or vote the wrong way, that believer was messed up before the commercial. Are y'all hearing me? So, so what, was, what was the message that issue one gave us? So out of 9 million people, you had about 4 million people voted. So out of 9 million 18 and older potential voters, only about 4 million voted. 1.7 million voted no, and about 2.2 million voted yes. And that's how the bill passed. Um, just to, to give some more context, in 2022, an unborn child was killed via abortion every 28 minutes in 2022. Um, surgical abortions account for about 51 percent, you know, where people are going to clinic somewhere and, and having a surgical abortion. But almost half of all these abortions that are taking place are chemical abortions. Which mail order abortions, which means the, the, the mother is now the abortionist. It is the saddest thing. My wife is the director of a crisis pregnancy center. She's here with me today. And um, it's the saddest thing to hear from these women who, um, you know, I I expel the baby at home, uh, usually in the bathroom, and, and they see what they have done uh, for the first time. And it is heart wrenching for those women and, and pregnancy centers all across the state are now having to love those women back to health um, as, as they have witnessed the most horrific thing in their lives and came crashing face to face with the reality of what they did. Um, you heard in the news that, you know, nobody's having partial birth abortions, late term abortions aren't happening. Um, we know for a fact that the baby that you see on the screen there, I don't know which, which picture, yeah. The baby you see on the screen there is an 11 week baby. And we know that 2,000, more than 2,000 abortions occur after that point. Does that look like a blob of tissue? No. That looks like all of you all in here, all of you under the sound of my voice, you all look like this at some point in your life. And some of y'all still look like that. Y'all got bald heads and, you know, anyway. Uh, <laughs> but this is what's going on in our state today. So for the older ones in the crowd, uh, thank you. Because the only demographic to vote no, uh, the majority of the demographic vote no, 65 and older. So, here you go. <laughs> right? I ain't do it, that was y'all, like I'm good, right? <laughs> the, the generation before Roe v. Wade, right? The generation before abortion became normal, abortion became health care, abortion became, you know, just something. It was my body, my right, my choice. The only generation that predominantly voted no was the generation before Roe v. Wade hit. The generation before that public policy became the law of the land in America. So don't tell me that public policy doesn't impact believers. 
that, that we're just here sojourning and that this earth is not our home, but yet this is America and we all have a say, we all have a voice and life abhors a vacuum. When we do not speak, it means that there are more people filling our, spoken, our, our speaking position. And that's what happens in America. If you look on um, the next slide, there's like two vials pouring in. Christians who believe the Bible teaches the inherent dignity of the life in the womb did not vote differently than the population at large. So Christian voters, about a third of them voted yes on abortion. Um, and, 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 you know, even though they admit uh, that life begins at conception. Family, this was not an issue of ignorance. They knew exactly what they were doing. And we voted just like those that don't know the Lord. I don't know if you all saw um, Bill Maher, politically incorrect. Uh, he's an atheist. He's a Democrat. Um, he uh, sometimes you've got to hear from the, you know, the unsaved folks to tell you the truth anymore about this stuff. But he was on a show and he basically made this statement. He said, pro-choice women like to say that pro-life women are anti-woman. And he said, that's not true. He said, pro-life women just believe that a baby is a baby and to take the life of a baby is murder. And this is what he said, and it kinda is. I just don't have a problem with it. Did you catch that? Bill Maher admitted that this isn't about pro-choice anything. It's about either you're murdering a child or you're not murdering the child. I agree with that. I just don't have a problem with that. He said, there's so many people in the world, you will not be missed, is what he said. And I know that makes us all cringe because it's Bill Maher and he's a national you know, person on TV. But what is it when, the, when one third of the body of Christ believes the same thing? Yes, I believe that it's a baby in the womb. Yes, I believe that life begins at conception. But 38% of weekly attending believers vote yes on abortion anyway. That's where we are. It wasn't the Democrats' fault. It wasn't the left's fault. It wasn't some million dollar commercial for 30 second fault. It was the body of Christ revealing how sin sick we are. And God is broken over it. And that's what I'm here to talk about for the rest of my time today. We have heard from Donald Trump what he thinks about abortion. 15 weeks, you know, blah, 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 leave it to the states. No other area do we leave murder to the states. No other area. You cannot kill a man in, in, in Arizona just like you cannot kill a man in Michigan. But when it comes to abortion, it's just an issue. We'll leave it to the states, right? We've heard from Newt Gingrich and, you know, all these different ones and, um, you know, different senators and, and congressmen and women. And, but what does God say? What does God say about what happened with issue one? See, I know many of you heard about Roe v. Wade and the difference between Roe v. Wade and what we did in Ohio is night and day. It's not even in the same category. Roe v. Wade was the decision to take the life of an unborn child and make it the law of the land, but the decision was only from a handful of Americans, the Supreme Court. What we did November 7th was the decision of every voting age Ohioan, and we chose Barabbas. That's the difference. Whether you voted or not, you had a voice. We had a voice. And a third of us chose to use our voice to murder children at any age in the womb. And a third of us chose not even to show up at all. But so what, Dave? That's just your opinion. Well, the Lord, after November, that Tuesday, shook me to my core and I couldn't, I couldn't get away from it. Um, and, and this is what he told me. So Sunday morning, three o'clock in the morning, I wake straight out of bed and um, I had this laundry list in my head. Put that list up for me after 50 years of church services, 50 years of Bible studies, 
50 years of prophetic conferences, 50 years of Christian life coaching, and 50 years of seminary degree, we still don't have enough truth, discernment, or Holy Ghost to not co-sign the murder of innocent babies in the womb. This was the heart of God. At three o'clock in the morning, I wake straight out of bed with this list. And I thought it was just me. I just thought I was so upset over this stuff, you know, because it's the, the week that it all happened. And I'm like, man, I, I must really be messed up. So we go to church and I'm in church and um, I, I get this scripture verse in my head. Do not go on bringing your worthless offerings. Your, your festivals and your feast days sicken me. They have become a burden to me out of Isaiah. And I told my wife and I, I, I couldn't remember where the passage was. And so I Googled it on my phone and I leaned over and I showed my wife and she was like, baby, you know, our, our church was strong. Like we, we did really good with issue one. I said, God is speaking to me about the church at large in the state of Ohio. Right. Not even just about an individual who might have an abortion. He was talking to me about the body of Christ in Ohio. And this was the passage that God has given me. <clears throat> the, the next uh, thing the Lord said was, and then, you know, I was having a hard time entering into worship. And the Lord said, don't let them just sing over this. Don't let them just sing over this. Like, you know, the election happened. I was doing all these interviews all across the country. They were calling me for interviews. They knew we were the tip of the spear of the campaign here in the state of Ohio. And um, at the end of all the interviews, everybody wanted to end on an encouraging note. <laughs> and I asked the question, why? We just co-signed in our Constitution the murder of innocent babies to the tune of about 30,000 a year is what that's going to look like in the state of Ohio. But you want me to end on an encouraging note. <laughs> what? And I'm in church. And come to find out, I wasn't the only one that felt that way. God told me, standing next to my wife, do not let them just sing over this. I told my wifey that. And I heard uh, somebody before worship started say, you know, Dave, God is still on the throne. He's still an awesome God. He is never defeated. But yeah, but, but we failed. God is God forever. But how many know man can fail God over and over? And God is telling me this morning, don't let them sing over this particular failure. We got to take a look at this one. And this is going to require some repentance because my heart is grieved. Let me show you what he was talking about. I don't know if you ever heard the story of the Jews, the Christian Jews um, that were in churches and the trains full of Jews going to the concentration camps would go right behind the church. And um, the people didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to look at it. They didn't want to deal with it. But they could hear the screams of the people on the church uh, in, in, the, uh, in the cars. And this is the actual account of a Jewish Christian um, recorded in, in uh, When a Nation Forgets God. He says, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. We heard stories of what was happening to the Jews, but we tried to distance ourselves from it because what could we do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church and on Sunday morning, we could hear the whistle in the distance and then the wheels coming over the tracks. We became disturbed when we heard the cries coming from the train as it passed by. We realized that it was carrying Jews like cattle in cars. Week after week, the whistle would blow. We dreaded to hear the sound of those wheels because we knew that we could hear the cries of the Jews en route to death camp. Their screams form, uh, uh, tormented us. We knew that the time the train was coming and we heard the whistle blow, we would begin singing hymns by the, the time the train came past our church. We were singing at the top of our voices. If we heard the screams, we sang more loudly and soon we heard them no more. And then 
eyewitness shared to a pastor, although years have passed, I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. This is what he said, family. God, forgive me. Forgive us all who call ourselves Christians and yet did nothing to intervene. Remember I said 38% of us voted yes to murder the innocent lives of children to the tune of 30,000 a year, but over a third chose not to show up and do anything at all. See, God wasn't asking us to go to Africa to build, you know, to dig whales in Mozambique. He wasn't asking us to give all we have and feed the homeless. All he said was in the beautiful state of, the, of Ohio, within the beautiful nation, free nation of America, all we had to do to protect 30,000 lives was get up off our couches. And over a course of 30 days, pick the most convenient day to push a button and save 30,000 babies a year. Man, he wasn't asking us to be missionaries. He was asking us to be good citizens of the great nation of America and protect children to make sure that his best interests are made in our state. And so he said, don't let them sing over this, David, like they sang over those trains in Jerusalem. And if you look at the screen, the very next song that came up and my wife is here to bear witness. She said it was raise a hallelujah. He says, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder. You're going to hear my praises roar up from the ashes. Hope will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. Sing a little louder. 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 And my wife looked at me after I told her what the Lord showed me as I stood at the front of the church that day. And she looked at me like, man, that's a word from the Lord. Now, I don't know how you're receiving this today, family. But I was gripped and broken because, listen, not just because of the 30,000 lives. It was, I was gripped and broken because the Lord was helping me to feel just a little piece of how he felt because of issue one. How grieved he was over the decision that we made. So the next morning is, is Monday, three o'clock in the morning, I wake straight up out of bed for the second morning in the row. And, um, and, I, and I get up and I pray and I weep and, um, and, I, and I, you know, for about 45 minutes to an hour, and then I go back to bed. Um, on my way to work, it's, uh, it's about, um, you know, 7 a.m. or so, and I, I look at the notification on my phone, put that up there, guys, and um, it was Troy McIntosh, he, one of my coworkers, um, and it said, just a reminder, Isaiah. <laughs> now, the, the full message said, just a reminder, Isaiah from Christian Academy will be shadowing us tomorrow blah, blah, blah. But on my phone, it just said, remember Isaiah. And it triggered the scripture God gave me that Sunday. And I thought, oh, the Lord wants me to study that passage out. I'll do it tomorrow. The next morning was Tuesday, three o'clock in the morning. I wake straight up. I said, okay, I'm gonna get down there. I read the passage, Isaiah 113. I pray, I go back to bed. I'm on my way to work again. And this is the actual text I get from my wifey. And um, she said, is Isaiah 114 the scripture you showed me on Sunday? And I was like, no, it was 113. She said, wow, Mary, her assistant, just texted that she was praying for you and Isaiah 14 might be an encouragement. So what was God saying? Thank you for getting up and reading Isaiah 113, but maybe we need to read the whole passage. Because <laughs> Isaiah 114 says the same thing. It's just reiterated. I want to read it to you. Isaiah 113. Do not go on bringing your worthless offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the proclamation of an assembly, 
I cannot endure wrongdoing in the festive assembly. 14, I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am tired of bearing them. This is what God is speaking to me. Like not just speaking to me, but shaking me up over a course of few days to say, get into the scriptures and hear my heart for what just happened. Never had anything like this happen to me before. Isaiah 1:15. listen very closely. Because the question was, why did our worship services sicken him? Why is he so burdened by what we call worship in America today? Self-serving worship. This is what he said. So when you spread your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Everybody say, why? See, when I was up that morning and I was studying the scriptures, that was the, the, the cry of my heart was, because I've read this before, but I never really asked the question, why was he so angry at his people? And it said very clearly in Isaiah 115, because your hands are covered in blood. I went to the concordance and I looked at what that was a response to. And it was uh, Psalm 106. Where when you start in Psalm 106, it starts to talk about how God delivered the people from Egypt and he parted the Red Sea. And we all love to talk about it in Sunday school, how God met the need of his people. So miraculously, God is so faithful and he split the Red Sea and they walked across on dry land and it consumed the Egyptians behind them. And they stepped on the dry land and they were right there, the land flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah. But then the passage continues. And it said that as soon as they got into the promised land, they began to turn their back on God again. And say, oh, thank you for your delivering power, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being real in my life. Not some old dusty book, but the true and living God who delivers even today. As witnessed by the Red Sea. And five minutes later, God's not good enough. And they start to worship themselves and created a calf of gold and started worshiping the golden calf like so many of us do. I know I've done it over the years myself. And then it gets down around the verse 35. And it says, but they mingled with the Gentiles in the midst of the promised land. They turned from God and started mingling with the people of this new land. America is the greatest country on the planet. Yes, it is. But remember the God of the country. Because when you don't, you turn your back on the God of the country and you start talking about how great America is. And yet we are not serving the purposes of God in America. We start serving the people of America. It says, but they mingle with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood. The blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan and the land was polluted with blood. Remix. Why was God so angry? Why is God so angry? at the American church in Ohio today because our hands are full of blood. One third of us voted to sacrifice our sons and our daughters and enshrine it in our state constitution. And another third might say they really care, but they didn't even care to show up and push a button so that God's babies can be delivered. This is where we are. So the next time we get mad at CNN and MSNBC and Bill Maher, we got to look at our heart and say, Father, forgive us. But you know, God is not going to leave us there. He's going to give us a solution. Many people ask me, 
David, why in the world, if we had so much unity, how in the world did we still lose? Um, and God gave me an answer in that. In both passages, Isaiah 1 and Psalm 106, he talks about the remnant. And in, in Isaiah 1, 9, he says, unless the Lord of hosts had have left us a very small remnant, he would have we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. He would have destroyed us had it not been for a very small but faithful remnant. And I'm thankful for that with issue one. Many of you were part of that remnant. Psalm 106, the second passage he gave me, says the same thing about the remnant. He says, therefore, he said that he would destroy them all had not Moses chosen one. Moses, the chosen one, stood. He had destroyed them all. Moses stood in the breach as the remnant for the majority of the people. And that's why I feel like God is holding his hand of judgment back from Ohio right now. When those tornadoes came through, I thought, Lord God, please, please. And he spared us. And I believe that's because of the remnant. Amen. As I close, what was his solution? What does God say we need to do moving forward? Isaiah 1:16. he gives us the prescription of where we need to go. He says, first of all, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Remove the evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. But how many know if I'm addicted to pornography, I can stop watching pornography. But if I don't get my heart right, if I don't, you know, get my sin, you know, covered and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, if I don't repent and be redeemed from the penalty of my sin, then I'm going to return right back to doing the evil deed. So God says we need to stop the sin, but we also need to repent so that it is removed from my sight. See, when the blood is applied, family, he sees it no more. He sees it no more. Verse 17, learn to do good. We're going to break all this down. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Don't vote with Planned Parenthood. Rebuke them for who they are. Right. Obtain justice for the orphan. Don't kill the orphan. I'm so sick of hearing people excuse abortion because we have so many babies out here now that nobody wants. Why bring more babies into the world? We got to think about that before we lay down. But after we lay down and we produce a child. That is not your choice anymore. That's a child. Amen. And God says, don't kill it because it doesn't have a father, love it, disciple it, raise up the next leader in our nation, seek justice. You know, the reason why black people, we know we're 12 percent of the population in America, but 48 percent of all the abortions, we are being targeted like we were uh, years ago with Margaret Sanger. Why? We're being targeted. And they're telling black women that you get to kill your kids more than any other race because you're oppressed. The man has his thumb on you, so you get to have an abortion. You get to kill your own children. Do y'all realize that back before 1980, black folks were pro-life? We were pro-life when folks was trying to kill us on the plantation, begging for opportunity just to have our own children and raise our own children. The Black Panthers were pro-life. Planned Parenthood tried to go into Brooklyn, New York and start clinics where all, you know, predominantly black. And the Black Panthers stood out with guns and said, not here. Jesse Jackson was pro-life. He was the number one speaker on the national right to life circuit until he decided to run for president because they knew if we're going to get the black people to kill themselves, we got to speak through the voice of pastors. And he was the first in line to sell us out, and it's still happening today because the devil hates us. Obtain justice for the uh, plead for the widow. Now, what can we do here? When it says learn to do good, we can educate people all about the positive reasons for choosing life. The fallacy of the secular sacred divide, we can destroy that. Separation of church and state, that's garbage. I told you this whole nation was founded literally 
on Jeremiah and Isaiah <laughs> and Romans, right? Educate people about abortion um, and what it does to children, mothers, and fathers. And yes, there are public policy solutions. Two, it says seek justice, teach fetal development. You don't have to go into schools and talk about pro-life and pro-choice. All you gotta do is go into schools and teach science. This is what you look like at 11 weeks. <laughs> and we laugh about how some of us still look like that way in school. You know what happened one time when I did that? I was in Bexley, very rich community. And a young girl comes up in, in the high school and she's weeping at the end of my presentation when I just talk about fetal development. Didn't talk about pro-life anything, just fetal development, science. And she said, is that what the baby really looks like at 12 weeks? And I said, yeah. She said, are you serious? I said, baby girl, it's the 20, like, I don't know, it was like 2018 at the time. I said, just Google it. I said, why do you ask? She said, I worked in my grandfather's abortion clinic for years as a volunteer, and I never knew that this is what we were aborting. Educate the next generation, because them just walking around church talking about I'm pro-life without knowing a daggone thing about what they are pro for, then the next election that comes up, we wonder why they all voted the wrong way. Because we assume they know, but they don't know. How are they going to know unless we have a preacher? How are we going to have a preacher unless he's sent? God's law, man's law, nature's law all support the personhood of babies. Listen, I can say, hey, I'm pro-life and you can say, hey, I'm pro-choice. But the bottom line is if we leave this parking lot and God forbid somebody's pregnant and she's on her way to have an abortion and somebody's drunk and they hit that woman on the way out and she loses that baby, he goes to jail for murder. Why? Because even man's law agrees that that is a child, not a choice. That's a baby. And as I close, I want to pray. Reprove the ruthless rather than supporting Planned Parenthood's abortion amendment, expose them. That's what Ephesians 5 says. Ephesians 5 says don't do what they do, but it doesn't stop there. That's where most Christians stop. It says, don't do what they do, but expose the darkness so that your next generation, your children, and your grandchildren will not end up doing what they do either. But if we're silent, we'll watch our generations go the way of heathens. As we are seeing today, defend the orphan, plead and contend for the widow. Father, forgive us. Lord, I wish I could come here today in the pulpit of my friend and give a nice, funny, touchy-feely message to make us all honk our horns and feel excited about being in church for a couple hours on this Sunday. But God, I ask that you would speak by your Holy Spirit to everyone inside and outside to how you are deeply grieved. God forbid that we would listen to Trump about what we should do with babies. God forbid that we would listen to the Democrats or the Republicans as how the body of Christ moves and, and decides what we do with the life of the unborn when you have been clear in your scriptures how you feel about the unborn. And God, we were all the unborn at one point. And as angry as some of us might be now because of experiences and decisions we have made, you you were so adamant while we were in the womb of our mothers, just like you're preaching today through this vessel, you cared about us. You were just as passionate when we were the unborn that was wavering between life and death. And thankfully, we made it. But God, the reality in Ohio is 30,000 babies because of the failure of your church will not make it. So Father, will you give us witty inventions? First of all, will you lead us into times of repent repentance? Break our heart for what breaks yours. And then we can put our wicked ways behind us and move forward in righteousness to save the next generation of your children. Lord, I thank you for the great 
candlestick and the shepherd over this house that is church at the center. Lord, would you just birth pro-life ministries out of this place? Will you birth mentoring programs for the orphan? Will you birth just healing ministries for women that have chosen to abort their children and fathers and men who have chosen to pay for them? God, will you raise up people that are so full of your love that they say there's redemption even available for you because your sin is not greater than mine and he saved me. Lord, I thank you that you're still speaking, that you're still delivering, that you're still wooing us away from our selfish, sinful nature into the loving arms of a righteous God. And Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Let it be so in Jesus' name. Amen.